Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. If you're interested, I post every week about growing cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, without any greenhouses or humidifiers or grow lights, just my very amateur talent. And they're either indoors or they're outdoors or they're not at all. So if that is of any interest, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday. And yes, what do you see before you plant lovers but the most delicious selogeny. And before we get any further, I, I just have to bathe in the fragrance. I should tell you what it's called. First of all, to put everyone out of their suspense, oh, the tag is a little stiff, and it is selogeny Janine Banks. Now, I actually think Janine should have two N's in the middle, J-A-N-N-I-N-E. -N -N -E. uh, I feel that's a spelling mistake. Anyway, we shall forgive the grower because it is the most fabulous plant. Alas, I can find no information about who Janine Banks actually was, but nonetheless, she is immortalized forever in this beautiful orchid. So as I said, this is a selogeny. We'll get to that. And it is a primary hybrid, which means it is a cross between two species. And the species that will cross to produce this divine plant are Flacida and Sologeny muriana. So they were the two that were crossed to produce this. Always interesting to know who your parents are, but it does give you a bit of an indication about growing conditions. But anyway, let us just roll back a little and talk about Sologenies in general. Now, you know I love a name description, and the word selogeny is derived from two Greek words, and the meaning is so esoteric, I'm not even going to bother try and explain it because I don't really understand. But anyway, if you're that curious, you can Google what selogeny means in Greek. But the other thing is the genus has a huge range of habitat and types. So it grows um, in the Himalayan regions all the way down through Southeast Asia and all across the Pacific to Fiji. So you can imagine huge variety of habitats there. So you can't really generalize about selogenies, but you could say that some are altitude cool growers and others aren't. And for me, here in Melbourne, the higher altitude, mostly the Himalayan types of selogenies, really thrive in my climate. So they are the ones I've tried to find, or the progeny thereof of their hybridization. So for me, the high altitude, cooler climate Himalayan selogenies really work. The more lowland tropical ones require more heat and humidity, which I just don't have. And then what I can say is that I have found the ones that I have got, this is a tautology I feel, relatively easy to grow and flower. So I made a video about the other selogeny that I bloomed, which I'll link below. And I think in the end, we have all decided that that is an unchained melody. I actually, I don't think I lost the tag. It actually had the wrong tag on it. Um, but I'm pretty sure after all your feedback that it is unchained melody beautiful beautiful flower lasted a long time and was absolutely gorgeous and so i was a little surprised that this selogeny janine banks has decided to bloom now because plant lovers we are in autumn here in australia now both the parents of this are described as either spring summer or summer flowering so i'm a little confused but anyway who cares here it is it is autumn in australia and janine banks has decided to burst forth and what, oh, what beautiful flowers. Now, if you kind of had to describe an orchid, surely selogeny flowers look so orchidy. I know that sounds really banal, but do you know what I mean? They just look like the most amazing orchids <laughs> because they are. The fragrance is beautiful. And do you know what it really reminds me of? Jonquils. It has that very spring-like bulbous jonquilly slightly daffodilly but more jonquilly fragrance and it's quite beautiful it's not overpowering but if you have the orchid on the table and you're walking past you'll certainly smell the fragrance but it's not going to knock you at the back of the head so it is a stunning fragrant orchid and i think what we might be able to see here plant lovers just lurking behind the name tag is another spike now i am not sure if that is another flower spike it's in the right position. It's still a little young to know whether it's going to be a new pseudobulb or not. But anyway, as it is the flowering time, I think perhaps we might have another spike on our hands, which will be stunning. Um, Selogeny flowers are quite long lasting. So hopefully this spike might just be on the turn as that spike, if it is one, starts to mature. So 
I'm gonna get months of Sologeny Janine Banks. All right, again, let me wind back and let me give you basic care. Um, I bought this as a division. So as you can see, it's a very large and beautiful plant. What you might also be able to see is a little stake and some twine because there wasn't much of a root system, I have to say, and I was a little concerned. It's a big plant and Sologenes kind of don't like being disturbed, so I may have overpotted it, but I didn't want to have to repot it very quickly. Also, I really wanted it to develop roots um, because it was just a little unstable in the pot, hence the stake. So I probably bought it about, not quite a year ago. So I imagine the division occurred after the mother plant finished flowering. And it's basically had all of our spring and summer to really develop an amazing root system, which it obviously has. And in fact, it has, because I will show you later that this fabulous pot, that the roots are actually starting to find their way out of the holes. So this is actually a great pot. Um, so we spent basically a year developing our root system together. And now the plant is actually very stable and I can probably take away the stake. Now there are seven blooms on the spike and I think there may have been an eighth, this one at the end, which has just for some reason blasted, but who cares because that spike is beautiful. They are the most beautiful flowers, as you can see, very, very white, white, and then very, very golden, golden orange. No, it is gold in the lip. Stunning, stunning, stunning flower with this amazing fragrance. So a really beautiful orchid to grow. And I'm here to tell you, comparatively easy. Again, a good care tip is to try and find the parents of your orchid, like being on ancestry.com and finding out what the natural environment is for those two or whoever the parents might be. So Flacida is a Himalayan species with quite a wide range of habitat and that is a slightly higher elevation and Moriana, the other parent, is found only in Vietnam and slightly lower elevations, but they're both described as cool growers. So the interesting thing though, obviously about those mountain ranges is that it's also a monsoonal weather system. They have obviously a very, very wet and obviously very humid summers, but then they have dry and cold, and we'll say cold winters. Now that is kind of the reverse of my climate here. We have dry, hot summers and cold, wet winters, but I grow this undercover outside all year. Now it can easily take the minimum temperatures that I get, which Melbourne city center tends not to go really much below freezing, a zero centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit, very, very rarely, and certainly not since I've been living here in the last few years. So generally the winter and nighttime minimum temperatures hover between sort of one to five degrees centigrade, so that's the high 30s, the low 40s Fahrenheit. So not freezing, but cold. But these higher altitude slogenies don't seem to mind that. But then the other thing is in summer, obviously in the Himalayas and these mountain areas, you have a lot of moisture and you have a lot of cloud cover. So the whole plant is sort of enveloped in this warm, moist, humid cloud, as you can imagine. So trying to replicate that is a little tricky, let's just say, but all I do really is I just miss them every morning. Um, in the warmer times of the year. So what I have learned is that Sologenes do love a drink, particularly obviously in the warmer times of the year. So when we get into the warmer temperatures, early spring here in Australia, all the way through, and it really depends when the temperatures start to cool down. It's still relatively warm at the moment, I must say, in autumn here in Australia. So I'm still watering these like bilio. They really love to drink in those warmer, sunny, hot times of the year. But then in winter, in their natural habitat, it's dry and cold. So you really just need to dial down that watering. And what I generally do most in winter here is mist them. I don't let them dry out completely because I'm not a desiccator. Um, the pseudobulbs will probably tell you if they're just getting too dry. But the trick is if you're ever going to water orchids in winter in the cold to make sure you do it in the morning when it is going to be sunny and perhaps a little windy and don't overwater it just a little and then that gives the medium plenty of time to dry out and the plant plenty of time to evaporate anything that may have got on the leaves. So you're not going to have a soggy, wet medium on a very cold winter's night because fat plant lovers can spell death. Okay, let's talk light. Now, 
In their natural habitat, they have less light in summer because of all this monsoony cloud cover in the leaves of the trees, and they have more light in winter because there's less cloud cover, less rain, and some of the trees are deciduous, but some are not. So there's generally more ambient light in their habitat. Now, about to shock you all, I leave mine in the same place all year. So it kind of has to just make its own way. So this is kind of the brightest indirect light. Now the leaves are actually quite leathery. You imagine looking at these leaves that they're actually quite fine, like catacetum orchids, but actually no, they're much more leathery. So they can actually take quite a bit of bright indirect light, so not direct sunlight. So mine get bright indirect sunlight, um, particularly in the first part of the day. Now mine grows, as I said, outside all year and plant lovers, I leave it in the same spot, which I know seems completely counterintuitive to all that we've just talked about, about its changing light requirements, but they seem to be okay. So let's go and have a look outside where Janine Banks lives all year round. So here we are outside. It is a overcast autumnal day here in Melbourne. Maximum temperature of 21 degrees. And this is where Janine lives, as you can see. And what you might be able to see up there is the polycarbon roof, which gives bright diffused light basically all day, which Janine seems to be able to manage quite well. We also get some morning light from the east over there and generally, yes, diffused light for the rest of the day. In the afternoon, the sun moves over though, so this area does get quite shady, but during the day, we have enough bright indirect light to promote flowering. So there you are, that is the growing area of Sologeny Janine Banks, as you can see outside in my grow space. So let us return. But plant lovers, I am going to be keeping Sologeny Janine Banks here on the dining table while the flower is open so we can enjoy the bloom and the amazing fragrance. And as you can see, because of the position of where it is, as the sun moves during the day, the afternoon is quite shady out there. So I don't know, it just seems to be happy enough. And I think it does actually get a little more direct winter light because the light is lower and is able to penetrate that part of my growing space more. But anyway, I don't really focus much attention on the light and moving it, which you might want to do, perhaps depending on your growing areas. But for me, it just seems happy sitting in the corner, doing its own thing and blooming. So my suggestion would be if you've kind of got a good spot, just leave it. Obviously, if the plant's not flowering, there is a problem. But if the plant is flowering, no problem. Now, what you might also be able to see, and I'll just come and show you, is that this leaf is perhaps looking a little yellow, a little tired, a little old, like the best of us. But this is the oldest pseudobulb, and it is quite natural, particularly as we start to get into winter, for these older leaves to start yellowing and starting to die back. The pseudobulb will remain, the leaf will separate itself very cleverly at that juncture there, the leaf will drop. So don't be alarmed at this time of year if one of your leaves or any leaves on the older pseudobulbs are starting to turn and look a bit off. It's a natural process. Medium wise, nothing too outrageously different. It is an epiphyte. So what you need is a free draining loose mix like many, many orchids. So again, remember most of these cool climate selogenies are epiphytic. So imagine they're lurking in little spots in tree branches or sometimes on cliff faces or wherever they might find a nook and water is going to pass them very quickly. It's going to drain very quickly. The plant will take out what it wants. The water moves on. So the essence is try and replicate that. So nothing too tight, nothing too stodgy. Although, so saying, I must say that with this one, I have got medium sized bark, but I also mixed smaller bark. And that was really for me just because there was a root system, but it wasn't huge. And the roots that were there were actually quite long, hence the pot. And I just wanted to make sure that I filled around them reasonably well and not have too much space because I also wanted the plant to stabilize because it was very wobbly. So I kind of created my own mix of slightly bigger, slightly smaller pieces to just create a better mix for it. There is also sphagnum moss because as we know, selogen is like their moisture, but they want a free drain. There's also a bit of charcoal in there, a bit of perlite, and I always put a little dash of mycorrhizal fungi powder in my potting. The other thing that I put in the mix is a few grains of slow release fertilizer, 
which brings us quite naturally to fertilizing. So whenever I repot something, I always put a few grains of slow release fertilizer in the mix. And then every spring, I will put a topical application of a few grains of a slow release fertilizer. And when I say a few grains, plant lovers, I mean literally two to three, not half a teaspoon. <laughs> Obviously, it depends how big the plant is, the bigger the specimen, the more food it's gonna need. I always treat them a little mean. Obviously, all kids that do bloom twice in a year, you might want to do that twice. But anyway, talking about slogenies, I just give them a topical treatment of slow-release fertilizer once a year in spring. And then during the peak growing season, which is the warmer parts of spring all the way through until the weather starts to cool down again in autumn, every three waters or so, I use a soluble fertilizer. And that could be something that is specifically targeted at orchids, or it could be a seaweed-based tonic really, or a fish emulsion based general fertilizer, anything, it doesn't really matter, I don't feel, as long as you dial down the dilution. I tend to dilute mine down to at least one sixth, one eighth of the recommended dose, otherwise it's just too strong, I think. And the other thing maybe just to note is that, you see this fabulous pot, uh, which we'll get to, but I actually lined the pot with sphagnum moss to sort of create a nest for the bark. Um, largely really to stop any bark pieces falling out of the holes and the perlite and the smaller charcoal bits. So that's how I really use the sphagnum moss, which obviously then retains moisture and provides a bit of a better environment. And so let us talk about this pot, plant lovers. You know, I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy, and I was thrilled to find these. I first saw pots like this in the Rio de Janeiro Botanic Gardens in the Orchid House many, many years ago. It was such a thrill to be there cannot find them in Australia. I think in the States it's much easier to find pots like this, but not here. Anyway, I happen to find a local guy here in Melbourne who goes to Vietnam to buy his pots. He has a garden pot center. And I saw some of these online because every now and then I Google, oh, terracotta orchid pots, just to see what pops up, nothing. So the local hardware stores will have orchid pots that just have four sort of rectangular slits. They're okay. But obviously the more holes, the better for epiphytes. You get more air and evaporation around the roots. So imagine my delight. So I went off to the pot shop and there was a part of them on the table. And I said, oh, great. You know, how many do you have? How often do you get them? And because of COVID, he actually wasn't going back to Vietnam because he couldn't. And he didn't really know if the factory was still going to be producing. It's a small family business in Vietnam. And then there were supply chain issues about getting them to Australia, even if they were being manufactured. So plant lovers, I bought everything that he had, which means I am not going to put a tag as to where the shop was because there were none left. But you know, I live for terracotta. It evaporates quickly. So it tends to not keep your orchid roots soggy, which is never a good thing. The negative obviously is in summer, it can dry out really quickly. So you've got to keep your eye on it. But so saying, I don't dig plastic, but if you're in an environment where it's the easiest thing for you, then fine, plastic will do just as well. I think the thing with plastic is just remember, it does retain moisture more, which can be good, but the negative is your roots can perhaps get a bit soggy in the medium and particularly winter, if it's cold, just be careful about not over watering in plastic pots in cold weather. There we are, plant lovers. Honestly, Sologeny Janine Banks is a joy and I have really not focused on this at all. It just sits in the corner, as you saw, doing its own thing and then pa -da, there we have this spike. And I'm not sure if that is another flower spike or a pseudobulb spike. Um, either is good, obviously. The name of the game with all orchids is vegetative growth because the more growth you have, the more pseudobulbs you'll have, the more opportunity for flowering you'll have. So I hope that you have loved seeing my Sologeny Janine Banks as much as I have. Oh my goodness, the fragrance. Ah, heavenly, like jonquils, just like jonquils. So I do post every week, so hit subscribe if you think this is of any use to you, my amateur ramblings about growing orchids here in Melbourne. I hope all's well wherever you are in these crazy times, but I look very much forward to seeing you next week with another orchid adventure. So until then, take care.